to me, that's what has always been needed, which was to give light the importance it is to, to a plant. In fact, I would say if a plant wrote a book about how to grow themselves, they would talk extensively about light and that watering it would just be, oh, you know, whenever I need it. You, if you look at whenever I need it, it it'll be a simple matter of just looking at the soil. Um, you know, fertilizer, repotting, and all that stuff is, is all going to be secondary to like how well can I grow is dependent completely on how good my light is, right? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Get Up and Grow podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Schauberg, owner of Active Grow. Today, I'm super excited to have a pioneer in the growing space with us today. His name is Daryl Chung of the House Plant Journal. He takes a unique look at growing houseplants from an engineer's perspective and educates growers how to use natural light more effectively to grow healthier plants indoors. He's also the author of the popular book, The New Plant Parent, that is being sold around the world and is written in multiple languages. He also has a lot to teach us today. So please enjoy my conversation with Daryl Chung of the House Plant Journal. Hi, Daryl. Thanks for joining the podcast today. It's really good to have you here. Hey, Taylor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I mean, I've been following you a while and I think, you know, you're super in interesting for the houseplant community. You're doing a lot of innovative things. You have an engineering background. You wrote a really interesting book. You have this light meter things. I want to get into all that, but I wanted to just start um, asking you, how did you first become interested in house plants and plant care. Sure, sure. So uh, yeah, many years ago, when I was still living at home with my mom, she said, Oh, help me decorate the house with some house plants. Uh, but she added, but you need to figure out how to take care of them because she claimed to be bad with house plants. And this was confusing to me because she taught me how to do outdoor gardening. She was great with like outdoor vegetables and all that kind of mm -hmm. good stuff. But indoors, she seemed to have this mentality that she kills everything, which I'm sure you hear a lot yeah. in terms of when people talk about houseplants. So I said, okay, I'll just buy a bunch of plants and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Now, what was really, uh, I guess, like serendipitous was that our house had two really big skylights in the upstairs foyer. So then that's like, so the plants were growing excellent. And I said to myself as an engineer, okay, it's not because I have some magical skill. It's be clearly because there's something in this environment that's allowing them to thrive, mm -hmm. right? And that's when I <laughs> pulled out my old light meter that I used to use for photography and mm -hmm. like just started measuring and, and realizing that there is a dramatic difference in light levels as you move farther from a window, so-called bright indirect light. That is this kind of this blanket term that actually doesn't mean anything or it means mm -hmm. everything to lots of people. And so it was then that I just decided, okay, I'm going to start documenting how my plants do. And that's how houseplant journal began. It was just a journal okay. for my houseplants. So that's sort of how it all started. And I, you know, started on Tumblr, not really many people use that. I then switched over to Instagram. And then like, I think, I think it was already like the houseplants was already on the uptick in social media. And then I think uh, the, the pandemic made it even bigger. So then right. I can attribute a lot of my growth to just the overall general interest. But I remember you being huge before the pandemic. Like, how long <laughs> was it when you switched from Tumblr to Instagram? When How long ago was that? I uh, uh, switched to Instagram in 2015. Okay, so. So that was, yeah, well before pandemic, yes. But I think the one of the big turning points was uh, on Instagram when they started allowing 15-second video clips to be posted. And that's when I posted my time-lapse videos, you know, of like plants hydrating or oxalis leaves kind of flapping back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and later on, even like leaves fully growing, like these are like several weeks long time-lapse videos. And so I started posting these and I, I'm pretty sure that that's probably what would help my account grow a lot because they were like, those videos were picked up by lots of big news outlets on Facebook even and right. other stuff. So that's sort of where I can attribute a lot of the growth to. And then, yeah. uh, well, and then the other half of that would also just be when I talked about plant care, I wasn't just saying the same usual, usual things. 
but I was actually trying to be more precise and be more, I guess, like direct with, okay, when you say water thoroughly, what does that mean? Well, it means you take it to the sink and you fully saturate it until the, literally the, the soil is like dripping wet and you let the excess drip away before you put it back. That like, so almost like making no assumptions that people just know when you say, give it bright and direct light, full stop. What does that even mean? Right? So it's, I, I sort of decided I would be more precise with writing it. And I guess this will lead into the next part about writing a book, which is a literary agent reached out to me and said, Hey, I think, you know, you could write a really good book about houseplant care in the way that you write more precisely and in a way that's accessible. So it's not using all this jargon. So, so yeah, we put together a proposal and then, you know, got a contract and that was really wonderful, uh, like opportunity. And so that's how my book came about, which is the new plant parent right over here. <laughs> yeah, it's a super useful book. So you, you, you had an, you came from an engineering background. Uh, yes. Did you go to school for that or how did that come about? Yeah. So I studied uh, engineering at the university of Toronto, um, something called industrial engineering and industrial engineering is all about understanding like, <clears throat> excuse me, like how systems are put together how uh, humans interface with all kinds of things. I mean, you know about uh, user interfaces all throughout like apps and, and on the internet and how we use mm -hmm. things. So that's kind of the study of like one of why, sorry, one of the disciplines in industrial engineering. And I sort of took that same systems thinking, like understanding uh, or user experience kind of thinking. When I look at how houseplant care is, taught and disseminated and realized it's pretty terrible <laughs> yeah in terms of how vague it can be and yet we just sort of let people off and like yeah yeah bright and direct light go go find it right and so yeah. it's it's sort of like um yeah seeing that gap in at least i could say it's not that i'm saying that you know my way is better or anything but that i just wanted to say it differently and in a way that resonated with me and maybe people like me who are more technical minded. And so I think it's just good to have a bigger variety of ways of talking about even even the same subject, right? We don't have to always say the same types of words for talking about houseplant care. Like, why can't we start talking about DLI? Why can't we start talking about measuring light? Um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's just a, it's just a good thing to add variety to the houseplant care, I guess, realm. Sure. Yeah. So lighting for you, lighting, it was a huge part of it because uh, you saw just a lack of information, specific information. Um, yeah, I'm I'm in the lighting business. I'm uh, I started the company kind of the same, like trying to be very specific. But then there's a lot of people that are super confused. Like I'll be like, OK, this uh, Monstera plant, it needs 250 to 500, you know, UMOs uh, at you know, for 12 hours a day or something, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, people are like, that's one end of the spectrum, this very specific thing. And then there's the other end of people that are just like, what does that even mean? So how do you get those people from from here to there and uh, not overwhelm them? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm doing such a great job of not overwhelming them, but <laughs> I will say that people are hungry to to learn right? They, they want to learn and they know that there's more to learn. Like they know that bright indirect light and medium light, like they know that that's not really, they like, like I'm even hand waving as I say it, but they like, it's a very hand wavy way of describing it. They know that, but they just have not heard the alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. And, or I mean, going into a bigger idea, like there's just no system to understand indoor light as there is a system for, growing cannabis, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, let's face it, people had to grow cannabis in their in their basements. So they they already had very precise instructions. Okay, you get, you know, this CMH light, okay, it's going to be this wattage. Oh, okay, then you need to put it this distance away, keep it on for, I don't know, 16 hours, or whatever. Oh, when it comes flowering, okay, you got to switch it to the high pressure sodium. And then you, you know, and the light is so, like there's so few lights that people can just give you a specification for every right. single light. But with houseplants, as in, you know, casually growing ornamental foliage plants 
in a in a natural light environment in a home, it's sort of like the wild west of potential <laughs> daily light integral values, right? right? We have no idea because someone could say west window that doesn't tell you how big the window is, doesn't tell you the obstructions that are outside, like you know, because you could say, oh, it gets afternoon light or afternoon sun. But what if you have a whole bunch of trees? What if you're in a building and you're way high up and there's no trees at all? Like it, mm -hmm. all of that plays such a big role in it that we are in the houseplant care, at least we're generalizing based on window direction or just some subjective sense of brightness. And yet the objective DLI value that someone might get can be completely different. So it's like, short of using a DLI logging light sensor, which I have done for mm -hmm. indoor space, then we need to either do, we could do two things. We could either change the very simple guidelines. Like, you know, if someone's not interested in measuring light, this is what I tell people. I just tell them, just put your plants as close to your largest window as possible. And only if the sun is going to shine on your so-called bright and dark light plant, for longer than two or three hours, then you might consider either moving it back or putting a, a white sheer curtain in front. Mm -hmm. Because that's the simplest guideline that still allows the plant to get, hopefully, an adequate DLI. Now, once you start taking a light meter and going the next step to start measuring, then now I can, like, I can almost immediately tell you, okay, well, if you're getting between 200 to 400 foot candles. I'm going to go back to foot candles for now. If you're getting between your indirect light between 200 and 400 foot candles, okay, then you probably have like an eight foot window by, you know, whatever height, right? But if you're measuring it and you're not getting anything higher than 100 to 200, well, then either your window is too small or you're standing too far back from the window, hmm. right? And it, it's the, like the reason for this precision is because light levels like vary so dramatically and yet our eyes when we just look at everything it doesn't feel you know 10x difference it just right. looks like okay yeah i guess it's slightly darker sure but your eyes are constantly adjusting and so our brains will never give us sort of the true sense or like the calibration of how drastically different the light levels can be right i don't want to confuse people too much uh, we've said the word DLI. Maybe if you want to explain what that is, or <laughs> sure, sure. So, so like, I think yeah, I might as well go into this too. Like, let's talk about an analogous concept, just so that I can just say, okay, therefore think of DLI like this. It might be easier, mm, sure. right? Because everyone can give you the textbook definition, but let me give you an analogous definition, which is that you every day when we travel, we have our speed, like the speed of your car, but we also have the total distance traveled, right? So if you're on a train and it goes, I don't know, 100 miles an hour, and you say, I'm in that train for two hours, then you can safely say, well, I've traveled 200 miles, right? Mm -hmm. So what, that, what I'm saying here is, earlier you talked about PPFD, which is the mic, like mu moles, that's like the instantaneous, that's the speed of the train. DLI would be the total distance or the total light received over the 24 hour period. So mm -hmm. grow lights is a perfect example to talk about this because it's, it's easier in terms of conceptually. And that is you turn on the grow light, you measure, you take your PPFD meter and it gives you a hundred micromoles, right? And you say to yourself, okay, I know I'm going to keep this on for 12 hours. So what is the DLI? Like, what is the total light received? Well, then you got to take your 100 micromoles, multiply it by 3,600 because of 60 seconds per minute, minutes per hour. And then you multiply it by 12 because you know you're going to keep it on for 12 hours and then uh, divide it by a million. And then that big number or becomes a small number. That number represents how many moles of photons hit the plant for the 12 hours you kept the grow light on mm -hmm. right now even like that's all, i said already the simple example just think about how the ppfd constantly changes for natural light you have clouds you have the sun moving across the sky so 
the the variance of natural light is just so much more that that's why it's kind of like impractical to try and measure the DLI for natural light. I've done it before. You have to basically keep the the sensor there, logging the light levels. I did it for like two weeks straight. I did it for two weeks straight in the springtime. I did it for the same spot two weeks straight in the winter. And I did it for two weeks straight in the summer. Fall, I assumed it was the same as the spring because, you know, time difference was the same. Like the length of day was roughly the same. So right. it's like you it's almost like impractical to try and state the DLI for natural light, but it's very practical to state the DLI for grow lights because of the fact that you turn it on, it stays roughly the same brightness all the time. You control the brightness because you put it closer or farther and you also control the how long it is. So that's why when someone says to you, you know, uh, you're growing a tomato seedling or the seedling stage, oh, it needs a roughly six to 10 moles a day. Well, then you do your own little calculations and you know how far you did put a grow light, how long you need to turn on, all that good stuff, right? So it's, it, it's, I guess you could say, this is the math of light, is DLI, PPFD, and the practicality is you need like a meter to measure this and you have to know how to do the calculation. And, you know, there's the PPFD, there's the DLI, but I mean, we can get into some other stuff, but I think it would make sense to transition into how you have developed a product and what your product looks at and how that can be uh, useful for people who grow houseplants indoors, which is mm -hmm. uh, so, your, your, your meter. <laughs> yeah, so uh, like I brought over here, this little thing here, um, we'll turn it on. So this meter has uh, not only light, but temperature and humidity as well. So nice. yeah, 55% humidity, pretty good in here. Um, and as I move it closer to this light, you can see the number gets, gets higher. It's backwards for me, but hopefully it'll be forward for you. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the now, okay, I mentioned PPFD, and that's like if you have, this is a Apogee Instruments PPFD meter, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually the EPAR version, which nice. is takes the, um, it. so instead of just being 400 to 700 nanometers, it takes it up to, I think, 750, um, because... Uh, it's something about like the the far red light right. plays a part in photosynthesis, and therefore they think that it should be counted as True. part of par photons. Yes. Um, anyway, so regardless of definitions changing or whatnot, um, the the thing is, in my research of making the light meter, uh, it's quite a lot more expensive to to filter out and also have the circuitry to get the 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 wavelengths exactly 400 to 700 hmm. right so in that sense what i did was i then just went back to the old lux uh definition of of illuminance which i mean in those like when i look at the other types of light meters the the lux meters you know <laughs> of course i open them up and they all have a kind of green filter in front right hmm. and that is because the illuminance definition is okay you want to be like it's a like kind of like a bell curve right so from 400 to 700 400 and 700 are very low sensitivity for the human eye but then it gets higher and higher as you get towards 500 which is like green and, and yellow right so so those lux meters have a green filter in front but what i did was i i changed it to be i guess you could say the par filter which is cutting out just infrared and ultraviolet which makes the middle part like roughly equal sensitivity right yeah. so so basically what i'm saying is even though my circuitry is not calibrated for pure like par the filter is so in a sense this is a roughly <laughs> slightly inaccurate for foot candles but it actually makes it better accuracy for white uh, led grow lights okay so so anyway then the other thing we have to talk about with with um uh spectrum and w when we're using par versus uh you know foot candles and those kinds of things is that even though the 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 cur like the sensitivity curve is different between par and lux mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. or or par and uh, lumens technically is the is the the bell curve, but it actually depends on what light we're measuring that will give you the bigger discrepancy between the two values of PPFD versus foot candles, right? And this is like the sort of historical reason, and that is at the time when cannabis uh, growers had to use, um, they only had the choice of either natural light outside if it was legal to do it outside or uh, ceramic metal halide for the vegetative phase and then high pressure sodium for the for the flowering phase. Well, yeah. ceramic metal halide and high pressure sodium, if you look at their spectrum, it's like very spiky ver- versus natural light, which is a beautiful kind of, yeah. you know, bigger, smooth kind of curve, right? Mm-hmm. So you can imagine that because of this discrepancy of how smooth natural light is versus the spikiness of this, the, or those two artificial lights, that a foot candle meter, if it was only registering the foot candle, it would it would kind of like underrepresent how strong, like how bright that light feels, even though the PPFD was for sure high enough if you use a proper par meter for those types of lights. So right. what was what was happening in in the days of using, like before they discovered the, the like using the par meters, was that people were putting their their ceramic metal halide lights really close in order to get, you know, 5,000 foot candles when in fact the PPFD was like way high because it, it didn't actually register those very spiky kind of things, but rather it was just registering it as, okay, what does this brightness feel right. like for a human eye? Mm-hmm. So all this to say that this is no longer an issue with white LED lights. White LED is also a nice smooth kind of bell curve. Mm-hmm. It's still not quite as nice as natural light. You know what? In fact, I can do this right now because I have a spectrometer. <laughs> and that is to say, okay, so spectrometer, if I go over here for natural light, this is this is what natural light through wow, a window nice looks reading. like. Right? Yeah, but then beautiful. if I go to my LED light over here, this is yeah. this is LED like reading, right? 5,000K. Uh, yeah, this is 5,000K. You can tell because the blue spike is so much higher than the mm-hmm. red, right? Um, so, so basically, I'm, I'm going to see if this works. Here. <laughs> oh, it does. Okay, good. So I happen to have, I just turned on an old fluorescent light. Okay. You got it all set up. Look look at this. I don't know if you can see this. I can this, barely look, see look that, how, but oh, now I'm starting to see it. Yeah, blue spikes see how spiky? spikes everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is the reason why foot candle and PPFD had such a big discrepancy if you measure number one, fluorescent lights, ceramic metal halide, or high pressure sodium lights. Those three types of lights all look kind of like this. But now when we have LEDs, like we get this, which is a lot better. And also now it brings the foot candle and PPFD reading closer to what natural light is in terms of its conversion factor, which if we like natural light like this. And in fact, the reason why this, this red part here is so much higher is because I'm just reading like the, the kind of indirect light coming through my window right. and infrared light is, is, is a longer wavelength and it just kind of goes everywhere. But if I was to stand outside and, and shine this right at the sun and measure it, it, it would be a lot more even. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, so all this to say that today when we measure um, white LED lights, that the discrepancy between PPFD and foot candle is no longer uh, such an issue that I can now sell this for cheaper than a, than a PPFD meter yeah. and still people will get the same result. As that is, they will know with pretty good certainty how far away to put the grow light. They will know like how to calculate the DLI and everything. Um, I mean, as long as you're using the same conversion factor, then it, 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 this is kind of like a, another, I guess, thinking is that like, if I'm just growing my tropical foliage plants, then I don't need to even know my DLI to be that accurate with the grow lights, as long as it's somewhere in the range, 
right? Yeah. If, if I'm running a scientific study, if I'm growing a commercial scale, I don't know, cannabis or tomatoes or whatever, then perhaps I should invest in a PAR meter. Yeah. But if I'm just casually growing my houseplants and I just want them to grow, grow nicely, then a much cheaper Lux meter will, will still tell you the same information is, I guess, my point. Yeah, no, it will. Um, on your on your website, you also have kind of guidelines for people for all these different plant types. For like, if you have this lumen output, or, or for this plant, this is the recommended lumen output. For this plant, it's the recommended lumen output. You have this kind of chart, don't you, on your website? Right, right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it's not lumen output. It's it's uh, the light received. Lux. So, so, so lumen lumen is yeah. the rating of the output of a bulb, but then foot candle and lux is the is the measurement right. of the light received at a certain distance, right? I should know that. <laughs> but no, no, yeah. I mean, but it's easy. It's easy to confuse these two because I mean, technically they are related, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, but uh, yeah, lux on, yeah, uh, on the website lumens is, lumens is like photons, and uh, lux is like PPFD, right? Because PPFD is received the, the light received, whereas uh, the lumens is is output from the source M meaning that if you put the like even like for example you say to somebody oh this this grow light you know puts out 2000 lumens well that's great but if you put this light 20 feet away from your plant it's not going to do anything <laughs> right mm -hmm. so it's like to to know the difference is to say like versus when i give my recommendations then i'm making my i guess you could say the the i'm making my data to be agnostic of any specific grow light and just say whatever grow light you use just turn it on and measure from wherever distance you are if it's too low then move it closer if it's if it's way too high then move it farther back that's all i'm saying mm -hmm. and it's it's more of a a way to empower the user to to be able to uh, control their own environment to, and to know how it works in terms of yeah. controlling it yeah give them the tools and then if they're ambitious to try to go and like, just like piece it together. Cause it's very hard to like lay it all out. You know, it's that it, you, it, once you understand how it works, then you could apply it to any, <clears throat> like any application or any plant type, but there is a little bit of learning. There was a little bit of like thinking, you know, there's a little bit of calculation that has to happen to get that result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you've been helping a lot of people out there. Uh, like, are you getting, you're getting good feedback on the product. You're getting good, like, are people saying, oh, wow, this helped me. This is like, look at my results. Are you seeing this, this mm -hmm. feedback? Yeah. yeah, I would say that it's so the the way that it's helping people is, is again, this sort of idea that, you know, it's not for everyone, right? So it's, it's not a tool that's just going to be like, oh, it'll tell you, put it here. It'll tell you, put it there. Like, that's not the way that this works. This is more of like, hmm. like when you buy a ruler, it doesn't teach you how, or a, like a measuring tape. It's just a tool that helps you understand distances. It doesn't teach you how to build the house, right? So the light meter just tells you how bright is it, you know, right here, right now. But it's still up to you to understand how does your light change over the whole day, which is why I encourage measuring frequently at the same spot. So you get a sense of what levels you're going to get in this day, like in, in this spot, right? And of course, I'm talking about for natural light. Of course, yeah. with the grow light, as I mentioned, it's easy. You just turn it on you and then you also know how long you're keeping it on. So that calculation is much easier. It's more controlled. Exactly, controlled. But for natural light, you, you do need to measure on a frequent basis. And I think the main thing that it helps you with is really, I guess, calibrating your own sense of exactly how far can I put a plant from this, you know, whatever window and still get okay, let's say 100 foot candles, enough for a snake plant kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the sense that I'm helping people to develop. And eventually, they may not even need a light meter to understand like exactly how far away they can put it, right? But it's just that because there's infinitely different size windows and infinitely different, you know, because pe people may have multiple windows, which is great, or skylights even, then measuring light is what is what allows you to then I guess, make more confident decisions about that. What are some uh, plants that people buy and they completely don't know 
generally like have the most questions about when it comes to indoor lighting or indoor lighting for them? Uh, so fiddly fig is like the classic, okay. classic example. I think because um, it's often shown in a lot of design magazines because it looks structural and kind of cool, right? Yeah. Um, but 90% of those photos, I, I'll say to myself, that plant's going to die in two or three weeks. And, really? and when I say die, I mean, it will just constantly drop leaves to the point where you're, you are just kind of like disappointed in how this plant looks. And then you just quietly throw it away. That's what happens to a plant, which is that it will shed its solar panels to the point of balancing how much light it's receiving with what's available and how much it can support, right? Mm. Because when you look at a fiddle leaf fig all lush and everything, where did it spend the last year? Probably in a greenhouse where mm. the DLI was like between 10 and 20, right? So you, you just suddenly put it into the dark corner of your room and the DLI could be like less than one, then it's the same as a person who suddenly has 10 times less food to eat, what's going to happen? You're going to start losing weight and eventually you'll maybe even starve to death, so which is exactly what's images, happening to a plant in the dark corner. So you're saying those images are like staged most of the yeah, time. Yeah. Like they're, it's a beautiful, healthy people, plant. People mostly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the people mostly use plants in indoors for, for decor and therefore they will put it where they think it looks nice as opposed to the very well-known gardening tenant of the right plant for the right space, which implies you have to find the right space where a plant will, will actually grow for you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, indoors, that's mostly going to be right in front of the window. And, and, and of course, even certain plants will grow better than others right in front of the window um, because of just how varied people's windows can be. I don't Yeah. Lighting is such a huge topic. Uh, I mean, you said there's with cannabis, there's been a lot of studies, HPS, metal halide, CMH, now LED, now LED which is coming more and more common. Um, but houseplants is like this whole wild west. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's great that you're a pioneer in this area and you're really trying to like help people out because I just feel like so many people buy these plants and they just Put them well, like you said in the corner or something where it looks good and then you're like oh I, I murdered my house plant i'm such a bad plant parent <laughs> what do you say to those people that are just they're they just you know maybe they need a little bit of education or what, what can you say to those people to help them well i would say that you know if you want to buy a plant purely for decor and that you're willing to treat it like cut flowers that need to be replaced then by all means, buy the snake plant or whatever, or even fiddle leaf, put it wherever and just know for sure that it's going to just die slowly. Maybe die quickly if it's a fiddle leaf. But if you are looking to grow like a or cultivate an indoor garden, then you have to acknowledge that there are limitations to how far away you can put a plant from the window. And there are also limitations to how much light is received by your particular window. So that to realize that um, perhaps this whole idea of a green thumb, like why does, why does my grandmother grow such nice plants? Well, have you seen perhaps how big her windows are and how l little obstructions there are? Like the fact that people have different size windows is the main reason why the result of plant growth is so different between different different houses. It it doesn't matter like no matter how much skill I might have in watering or whatever, if I only have a small window, like I can't grow that many plants. It just that it's it's the limitation that we have to acknowledge and that you know people don't like to hear because well I mean even even plant sellers wouldn't really like to hear that because <laughs> they have no interest in telling people, oh this plant will not grow well right. for you. They might not They'll, have such a high just return. Yeah, they would rather just go with, oh, yeah, does great in low light. Sure, yeah. Yeah. When you say it does great, it means it it does just dies slower and less noticeably than other plants. Do you sense a lack of this education in gross, like plant growth stores? Is, is, or 
Yeah. Is that really a true thing you think, or are people really? Well, I think it's not a lack of education as much as it is, it is a, 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 a need to be a need to give good, nice to hear and comfortable advice, right? Because the perfect example is watering. The natural question to ask about watering is, how often do I water this plant? The question implies that this person thinks that each different plant has a specific frequency that is dependent upon the plant alone, right? But mm -hmm. whenever I, whenever someone asks me, how often do I water this plant? The, I guess you could say the snarky answer is whenever it needs. Okay. So then you, the next question is, how do I know when it needs to be watered? Then I'll say, okay, well, if it's like a cacti or a succulent or a snake plant, the time, like the need for watering only occurs once the soil is bone dry, like completely dry. Right. And when I say it in that way, it hopefully registers in the person's mind that, okay, if I'm putting this plant in my, let's call it south facing window and it gets three or four hours sun shining right on it, well, that soil can dry to, to be completely dry in, I don't know, three or four days. So then I would then remember I'm watering it whenever it's fully dry. I see that it's fully dry, therefore I water. It doesn't matter if it was five days ago. It doesn't matter if it was two weeks ago, right? That's sort of the, I guess, mentality is I approach watering as um, like an observation of soil dryness. Right. But the but the issue is, I just you know took I don't know two minutes to explain all that. But at a store, you don't have that kind of longer, more nuanced <laughs> explanation to give to someone. Right. You'd rather just say to them, ah, once a week, right? That because. <laughs> That's the way that people expect to have advice. They want it to be bite-sized and, you know, nice and easy and everything. And, and that's sort of like what I was fighting against, which is fighting against that kind of easy knee-jerk reaction sort of advice that, that makes it seem everything is easy without any nuance, that it doesn't help people actually understand how to water a plant. And in fact, makes them worse at it because then they'll put a plant anywhere they want, which step one is already bad for light, then step two, oh, it's uh, once a week. Okay, water, water, water. After five weeks, the plant rots and dies. Okay, then, oh, you overwatered it. Okay, then you put the plant in the same dark corner. And now, oh, I increased my watering to three weeks. Three weeks, three weeks, right. still dies, right? That's why the emphasis on light for me is so critical because because I know people don't think about light that much. Right. And yeah. the reason for using a light meter is then when you put a number to it, it's concrete. You cannot argue anymore to say, oh, I thought this was bright and dark light. Well, was it roughly 200 foot candles most of the day? No. If you started to use light meter, like nowadays, I can just look at where a person puts the plant and, and know that it's not even close. Right. So, so this, kind of, this kind of goes into your philosophy on growing plants it's 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 there's a lot of adjustment things change there's no perfect <laughs> plant that's going to grow indoors it's just like this pursuit of like co like trying to improve at least or, or learning right is that what you'd say your approach is yeah i would say that i i can summarize my approach as being uh that i accept that individual leaves they have a limited lifespan. That means if a leaf dies, I don't treat it as, oh, it's a sign of something wrong, but rather <laughs> it's it's that leaf's time to go. Goodbye. Uh, mm -hmm. But the contrast to this is, but I'm trying to give the conditions that are ripe to allow the plant to keep growing new leaves. Okay. So number one, I accept that leaves die. But number two, I'm trying to give the plant uh, enough good conditions so that new growth hopefully outpaces older growth that dies. And then the third point is I have to constantly embrace the fact that the structure of the plant is going to change and that at some point there may come a time when 
the structure is just, you know, I don't know, too ugly or too gangly, something that doesn't, you know, mesh with my, with what I think the plant should look like. And that it's time to sort of like write a new chapter, you know, propagate it, cut it back. Mostly propagation is, is the writing new chapter kind of thing. Right. So, mm -hmm. and to accept that this is the true, like holistic understanding of what it means to own a house plant in the long term. And that is to say, it's constantly changing. Leaves will constantly die. So you better make sure that it keeps growing new leaves. That's kind of like, if I can summarize it as quickly as possible, that's what it is. Cool. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's logical and, you know, respectful and yeah. I mean, you've been doing this a long enough time, so I'm just going to trust you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you see, this is the thing uh, I got one, one of the things I want to say, which is different is that like the purpose of growing vegetables or cannabis or anything or like any, any agricultural plant is that we want some, we want something from it. Right. So the goal production, of growing yeah. a plant is, is very well defined. If you know, you tweak the spectrum and whatever, and you get a little bit more yield, like in a, in a statistically significant way of, of cannabis or whatever it is that you want from the plant, then you can say, yeah, tweaking that little, that little thing, did something for my end goal. But with houseplants, unless you're like kind of like measuring leaf size and everything or whatever like that, which I don't think anyone really is, but unless we're we're having such strict like uh, uh, goals to grow a houseplant, like I'm just happy as long as the plant has a few nice leaves on it, that that's, yeah. that's what I'm happy with, right? So then in fact, the requirements, because they're so much looser, it, it makes the instruction of how to grow them more difficult because now we don't have as well-defined goals and, you know, cause it, causality things of A, A and B, you know, switching this little switch here and there. We don't have that precision anymore. So now when it comes to growing houseplants, it, it, it feels, like you said, the Wild Wild West, it just feels much less, less well-defined. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we appreciate you trying to define it in your book. What are some of the things you kind of cover in your book to help, you know, define the issues people are having? Yeah. So the, the book, I think in the first half of the book is like a general, like foundational principles of, of how you, how you look at your space and how you approach watering and all this good stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to say that the, the light section takes up the most space hmm. because to me, that's what, has always been needed, which was to give light the importance it is to, to a plant. In fact, I would say if a plant wrote a book about how to grow themselves, <laughs> they would talk extensively about light and that watering would just be, oh, you know, whenever I need it. You, If you look at whenever I need it, it's, it'll be a simple matter of just looking at the soil. Um, you know, fertilizer, repotting and all that stuff is, is all going to be secondary to like how well can I grow is dependent completely on how good my light is. Right. So anyway, the first half of the book is, is all about those fundamentals. And then the second half uh, talks about uh, specific plants. And I think what's different about my book is that it actually shows like progression over time of certain plants, just because I want to give people like a realistic sense of what does it look like to own a monstera for three years? What does it look like to have a mon maranta to actually decline because it had thrips? And I and I talk about it in the book and to show that not everything is going to be rosy. You just follow these like it's not like a it's not like a baking recipe where everything will work just because you follow the instructions, right? It's it's you're you're growing a plant. It's a living thing, and it's going to be subject to what I call like the the probability and harshness of nature, right? So not everything will work out and, and that that's okay for, for plants because you know that it's a living thing that's not supposed to be uh, perfect as long as you do everything perfect. Yeah, that's, that's such an awesome perspective and just a realistic one, I think, for a lot of people and they kind of need to hear that. And that's probably why, you know, it's such a popular book and so well received because <laughs> it's just honest oh, thank you, and, thank you. and not, you know, bullcrap. I guess <laughs> like all this flowery talk. 
Um, no pun intended. I have a question about sustainability. I know for home growing, um, maybe people don't think it's such a big deal if they have just a couple of house plants, but how can you like bring sustainability into growing plants at home? Is it even a big subject mm -hmm. or, or what can we do? Yeah, it, it is an interesting topic because like when you think about lands like agriculture and then even like your like now I live in a in a home with with property and stuff. So clearly the the stuff that I use outside, the volume is just so much more than what I do inside. Even if inside I have you know hundred plants, the, the the pots are so small that and I'm not replacing it you know every single year. So it's as if it's as if the concern seems to be you know a little less. But I will mm -hmm. say that from a different angle of sustainability, that the knowledge of of growing houseplants in a way that that allows you to keep them long term is in itself a sustainability issue, right? Because if, if you are just constantly killing plants, uh, you know, every and you keep replacing them, then we're kind of we're kind of like encouraging this this sort of consume like a you know throwaway mentality that oh I just buy them and, you know they're going to last for like less right. than a year and I just cut you know keep replacing them, whereas you know, I have one Monstera Thai constellation and I've kept it, I've had it for five years and I don't plan on ever, you know, not having it. I'm just going to keep growing that one plant for a long time. So in a sense, the ability to, to limit yourself in terms of how much you consume of plants is in itself like a sustainability goal and to have, and to see your plants as long-term things that keep growing over the long term and not to be so... I don't know, flippant with replacing them, then that, that's sort of like one big sustainability, I guess, uh, goal that people can have with, with houseplants in particular. Okay. Well, then that goes into my next question. For people who have been buying plants and they have been passing away or they're new to plant growing, what would you say to those people to kind of get them to the next level of not killing so many? Yeah, I would say that we, we, maybe the the first thing would be to like shift your mentality away from like reading advice and thinking that somehow proper care ensures that my plant will be perfect forever that that in itself is is what i think causes a spiral of you know i kill plants or whatever and, and that is just mm. that people see one yellow leaf and they think the whole plant is dying um and then they they start to do things that make it even worse, right? Mm -hmm. So instead, you realize that that leaf turnover is a completely natural thing for plants and that to also understand that your plant structure keeps changing so that now, instead of letting uh, the, the plant seller define what's a nice plant, because what they're defining as a nice plant is just what it looks like right now. Right. That's that's how they that's how they sell them, which is kind of funny because I like think about these really expensive plants, Monstera Thai Constellation, you know, oh, if it's bigger, it's worth more. So it's mm. like you're saying if I just buy a really small one and I'm able to grow it much bigger then I've effectively 10 X my investment just from having bought it earlier anyway. Right. But it's like when you. Uh, sorry, what were we talking about again <laughs> with the 10 Xing our Monstera plants? 10 next thing I'm wrong saying, yeah. Uh, no, this was about, I guess, uh, yeah, when you're a beginner, and you, yeah, yeah, when you're a beginner and you realize that you start to realize leaf turnover is natural and that the plant structure keeps changing, it also changes your tastes in what plants will, will grow well for you, right? So instead of, as I mentioned, having the seller define what you should have just because it looks nice, you will start buying the plants that actually grow well in the long term for you. So that means, for instance, I'm going to say it out, out loud that I, I don't like fiddle leaf figs because I don't have a big enough window where it will actually keep a nice shape. I mean, it, it could probably keep you know two or three leaves on each branch, but I don't like that way that looks. So therefore, I don't buy it. Mm. And whereas my Monstera Thai Constellation 
has like several huge, beautiful leaves. And even though I keep losing the older ones at the bottom, it keeps putting out a new one at the front. And I've been happy with how this plant looks uh, over these past years. So I say, okay, this is a nice plant that I like to keep for a long time. Okay. And it's really interesting when I kind of survey, um, you know, much older generation people, which plants do they still have? And they can tell me they've had it for 40 years, something crazy like that. And it is the staple classics, pothos, peace lily, Christmas cactus. These are plants that I've heard of people keeping for decades. So I, I have those. And of course, my plan is to keep them for decades. And so that's sort of like maybe not so good for plant sellers, but that's really the reality of, you know, if you're going to grow plants indoors, you've got to see the ones that have a long-term potential and and then, you know, treasure them that way. All right. So be realistic about your expectations and maybe also confirm your space and what you have going on in terms of light already and things like yeah. that before you just go buy the pretty thing. Exactly, um, exactly. Well, this has been a really engaging topic. I wanted to just ask you, like, how can people find you? Where can they get your book? Where can they sign up for your courses? You know, one-on-one -on -one consultations. You said you sure, offered sure. those. Where, yeah, all, where can all people that... find all this? <laughs> Yeah, I'm available at houseplantjournal.com and on Instagram also Houseplant Journal and YouTube Houseplant Journal. Uh, and, you know, all of those things have a link to this kind of like nice, you know, where all the links are are compiled together. And on it, you'll find uh, this light meter. It's called the LTH meter for light temperature humidity. Um, and then my book is called The New Plant Parent. And, um, yeah, it's available anywhere books are sold. And I actually just wanted to show you this very proud moment of saying that my book has been translated to Chinese, oh, to Chinese, Korean, and also German. What's it in German? Uh, Grüne Zuhaus. I love it. What are you seeing in the German market for house plants? Is there... Uh, well, I mean, I, my publisher has all those numbers. I don't really know. Okay. Um, but I mean, I, I would assume that, you know, if, if it was translated to that language, then that particular, um, uh, imprint or publisher believes that, it, you know, the market is there for, for the, for the book to be, to do well in that, in that other language. So yeah, I'm very, very happy with that, especially the Chinese one, because then I can, <laughs> Uh, give it to all my relatives and they can they can have a read of it. I don't even know what it says, so they have to tell me. <laughs> oh, they can, they can, does it say ni hao in there? Yeah, I'm sure it says something like that in there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it was uh, really awesome to talk to you, Daryl. Um, super informative. I think this is one of the more interesting conversations I've had with a guest, so I appreciate this and I hope we can follow up and, you know, yeah, see how things are going and I hope you can sell more books in other languages not just the ones you showed me <laughs> thank you but, thank you so much yeah it was a really wonderful talk taylor yeah daryl thank you very much talk to you later bye. thanks bye